and, and I want to wrestle with this, and I want to wrestle with the tension of this today. I believe that it's essential for where we are and where we're headed. Uh, first of all, we've already begun to establish when it comes to the soul that the soul refers to the inner life. Everybody say the inner life. And by way of review, we want to make sure that we are building sequentially off of where we've left off. So I want to encourage you to continue to stay online, log in, not just uh, in our physical assembly, but also making sure you're listening to these messages so that they're able to feed you. So we've already dealt with the soul dealing with the inner life. And on last week, we came out of 3 John 2, in which the Apostle John begins to write in the epistle of John uh, that he wants us to prosper and be in health even as your soul even as your soul may prosper. I want you to say, even as your soul may prosper. And that's significantly important, especially for where we are today, because of our present climate. Uh, when you look at where we are and what's going on around us, it appears as if the soil of the soul of America is sick. It appears as if all the stuff that we see in front of us is a very chaotic and a very crazy environment. And in spite of all of that, he says specifically to us, I don't want you just to be in health, but I want your soul to prosper. The prosperity of the soul then allows us to understand that we have to deal with believing, as I've said, believing, belonging, and becoming like Christ. Uh, it is spiritual formation. It is posturing ourselves to really understand the essence of who God has called us to be. How many of you know that where you are now is not where God desires you to be? Amen. That there is still more that he desires for you to do. No matter how old or how young you are, there is still a journey that we are on progressively as we are walking with the Lord. Hence the reason why years ago the saints of old would say uh, that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now, contrary to culture and popular belief, it looks as if almost sometimes, depending on what's going on in your life, that every day has been sour. But when you really understand the essence of walking with God, it goes beyond an emotional feeling. Amen. It goes beyond just how it looks in the moment. It is understanding that though trials come, that though tests come, that those circumstances come, that you have an anchor in God that is able to deliver you and set you free. Somebody amen. say amen. amen. And then now we come to this particular psalm, a psalm that deals with distress. I want to deal with this specifically because I sense the Lord highlighting this as I woke up this morning. I had something else prepared. But I don't know how many of you have been in distress. This is a psalm for distress. You may not be in distress, but how many of you know some folk who are in distress? And if you look on TV and you look on uh, your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, you'll see a whole lot of distress. And if you want to get the diss out, there's a whole lot of folks that are just stressed. But despite what we see in front of us with distress, despite what we see in front of us with stress, this psalm speaks to us as it pertains to the soul. And what is God saying? God is saying, despite what you see in front of you, my hand is on you. Despite what you see around you, my hand is on you. Despite what you see happening in the midst of trials and tragedies and tests, I am up to something in your life if only you have the ability to see beyond the moment. Notice what the psalmist says. He says, I remember these things. What are you remembering, David? I'm remembering the times when I was in distress and I went to the house of God. I don't run from God when I'm in trouble. I run, church, to God. Yeah. And so I remember all of the trials and the circumstances and the issues that had encountered me. And while I was in the midst of distress, I postured myself to your presence. Amen. And one thing I want us to understand this morning, hear me clearly, Virgin, hear me clearly, house, is that we have to posture ourselves to the presence of God. And I know we are constantly bombarded 24-7 with everybody trying to get our attention, but God is trying to tell you something. I want you to look at somebody and tell a neighbor, neighbor. God is trying to get your attention. And in the midst of your distress, there is a destination he has for you. There is a place he has for you. There is something he's going to bring you to. And that's why you have to let go and let go. 
notice what happens now. He says, why are you cast out? Why are you cast out? Notice the tension. Verse number four deals with joy. Verse number five deals with pain. What I've discovered is that also sometimes the greatest and exciting moments can also be the most frustrating and disappointment moments because disappointment comes when expectations have not been realized. And notice what the psalmist says. He says, why are you bowed down, oh my soul? Hear me carefully. Hear me carefully. Lean in. The distinction, uh, Kiki, the distinction between 3 John 2, when it talks about the soul, in the Greek, that is the word suke, whereby we get the word psyche and psychology. All right? So it deals with the direct, it deals with the direct uh, areas of the soul concerning the inner life and particularly the emotions and feelings. When he says, why are you cast down on my soul, in this particular passage, it deals with the word nefesh. And nefesh there is specifically allowing us to understand it's an inner thing. It deals with the heart. Which means that you can look great on your externals and your heart be ruined on the inside. Come on, talk to me. And notice now, he says, why are you bowed down on my soul? I see that everything else is going around you, but why are you cast down? He's asking himself a question, and when he's asking himself a question, he is looking to God for the solution. He says, why are you cast down on my soul? Hope yet in God. So I'm distressed, but I'm not going to lose my hope. Things are happening around me. But I'm not going to lose my expectation. And what I've discovered is that the distress comes in such a way that it makes you question if God can really get you through it. Well, somebody be honest enough to say that there are sometimes you incur you encounter distressful moments distressful situations in which the ground is shaking so much around you you have no idea how you'll be able to walk and not fall through because of the cracks but yet he says and yet I will yet praise him so I'm in the midst of distress I'm drowning in doubt but yet my hope is established in who you are my hope is not established in what I see. My hope is established in what you've promised me. And it is out of your promises that I understand I can't stop here. But I have to move in what you've promised me. And then notice what he says. He says, for the help of his countenance. I want to deal with this. For the help of his countenance. The countenance, first of all, deals with the appearance. What he's saying is, I'm distressed. I'm downcast. I'm discouraged. But I know when I look to you, you are able to handle where I am. And that's why you've got to be very careful who you lean on in hard times. Yes. Uh, look at somebody and tell them, are you leaning on Jesus? Oh, well, that's why I love the hymn of the church. What a fellowship. What a joy to find. Leaning on the everlasting arms. I, I've discovered that I can't lean on shaky foundations. And I also can't lean on scaffolding. Because whenever a building is under renovation, there is always scaffolding. And while the scaffolding is there, after a season, the scaffolding will be finished. And you'll look and won't even recognize the building because the front of it has changed. You can't lean on your scaffolding. You have to lean on the arms of Jesus and trust that he'll make a way where there is no way. Who am I preaching to this morning? God sent me to remind you that you have to ensure that your soul is postured to him, not just in his presence, but also in your mouth. That's why David said in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And with my mouth, my soul shall boast in the Lord. I'm either going to magnify my misery. I'm either going to magnify my mess. I'm either going to magnify my distress. Or I'm going to open my mouth and give God a shout of praise. Somebody do it. Open your mouth and give him a praise. I said open your mouth and give him a praise. Somebody tell them I'm not going to 
stay here. That's why you come to church. That's why you're here this morning. While no matter what's going on around you, when you come on these grounds, the ground that you walk on is holy ground. And you have a God that does not abandon you in the midst of your distress. You have a God that does not depend, that does not leave you in the midst of your trouble. You have a God that does not forget you in the midst of your agony. He says, call unto me. I have a hope in there. Yeah. I'm going to yet praise him yeah. in the midst of what I see. Yeah. So that word continence, first of all, deals with appearance. But then continence, secondly, deals with attention. It is the face turned to a subject. I want you to lean over and tell somebody, may I have your attention, please? Yeah. I have to make sure that I'm attentive to his presence. I have to make sure that I'm attentive to what he's promised me. I have to make sure that I'm not going to allow the stuff around me that's annoying me to cause me to be hindered from his presence. Yes. And that means that I have to recognize that no matter what I go through, that no matter what I face, that no matter what I deal with, uh, God has promised me and God has spoken that he's going to do something significant in my life. And I came to tell somebody this morning, you're in the midst of a turning point. Yes. And while it doesn't feel like it, yes. and while it doesn't seem like it, uh, God is up to something in your life. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, God is up to something in your life. Uh, and while you're at the midst of a turning point, uh, turn your pressure into praise. Uh, open up your mouth uh, and give God a shout. Oh, notice, notice now. He says, why are you cast down? Oh, my soul. So I am a soul. Everybody say, I am a soul. I am a soul. Made, made by God. By God. Made, made for, God, for God. And made, made to need God. To need God. So he says, uh, why are you cast down? I'm made by God. I'm made for God. And I'm made to need God. That's why the word soul, in the Hebrews, the word nephesh, it, it really deals with neediness. Neediness in this context is good. It can be dangerous when it comes to dealing with people, but it's great when it comes to God. What are you saying? He said, my soul is needed. That's why he said at the beginning, as the deer, pants for the water. So does my soul first for you. I have a neediness in my soul. That's why whenever you feel depleted and you feel on E, if you don't know what else to do, drop to your knees. Not to salute, but to open your mouth to God. Drop to your knees and cry out to him. Whenever you feel on E and you haven't made it to the sanctuary yet, open up your mouth and say, God, I need you. I need you to do something in my life. I need you to do something significant in front of me. Look at somebody telling you, my soul is needed. My soul is needed. And notice now what he says. He says uh, uh, it deals with the neediness. So I have to recognize that while I'm in the midst of a challenge, while I'm in the midst of a change, I have to still depend on God. Notice now, for the help of his countenance, it deals with the appearance, it deals with attention, but finally it deals with the anointing. Because it is only by the anointing of God that things around you can shift in your life. Yes. And we have tried today to replace anointing with talent. We tried today to replace anointing with skill. But I've seen a whole lot of folks who weren't skillful, but there was anointing on them. Yes. And the anointing only comes when your soul is needed. 
When you really are anointed by God, you can get a position you don't qualify. And for some reason, you're able to outperform the other people who are more qualified than you. Because he has anointed you. I feel a little old school this morning. I'm asking my dad to get on here this day. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, God has anointed me. I said, look at somebody and tell them, God has anointed me. I may not be qualified by other people. God has anointed me. I feel my help this morning. I may not be qualified by you, but God has anointed me. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am anointed. Get a good look at all the things around you. I am anointed. I'm going to preach through this place today. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, that's why the devil can't kill you. Because I am anointed. That's why you were trying to get out, but you're still here. Because you are anointed. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, Bless you, my friend. I want to thank you so much for watching this video. I pray that a word was spoken that transforms and changes your life. Please stay connected with us, www.globalfirenow.com. I'd love to hear from you. Expect great things.